In this video, we're going to look at the layout um, of a surface mine. So you get a sense of the different components uh, that exist on a typical surface mine. Uh, so we'll take a look at this diagram first, and then uh, we'll look at a real example of an operation um, to compare it with this sort of schematic diagram. Uh, so the first thing that I've drawn on here are the open pits. Um, and in this example, I've actually drawn two different pits here. Uh, there might not be two, there, there could be one or there could be uh, three or four for that matter. It kind of depends on the nature of the mineral deposits uh, uh, at the mine operation. Uh, in this case, I've drawn two different pits and probably what would happen is uh, these would be the initial pits that are focused right on the ore. And then as you get deeper down, the pits are likely to merge into one uh, larger pit. Uh, the second thing I'll point out here is waste rock. Uh, so again, uh, waste rock is the rock that has to be mined out of the pit in order to get uh, access to the ore. Uh, but it's not rock that has sufficient grade that you would uh, send it to the, uh, the process plant. It's, it's considered to uh, it would either have no mineralization or very low grade below cutoff uh, mineralization. Um, now, waste rock is uh, is rock that uh, you know it has to be drilled and blasted uh, in order to remove it out of the pit. Uh, but the size of the waste rock ranges from you know big, huge boulders down to pieces like this. Um, and so, when it's placed on the surface, it it can be placed in a way that it uh, remains stable. That these piles of rock that you put there are stable because the pieces are big enough that they will maintain stability on the surface. Of course, you can't make the piles too steep uh, or they won't be stable. So you have to design them in a way that they, they will remain stable. Uh, and one of the things that I'll just mention now, um, you know, while we're talking about waste rock is that before you develop your open pit, or before you put any rock on your waste rock piles, you're going to want to take off the topsoil. So, you know, it's a really straightforward and simple uh, approach to take, but you remove that growth medium, uh, you know, whatever vegetation was growing in, and you stockpile it uh, on the mine site until you're ready to use it for reclamation and closure. Pretty straightforward process, um, but, you know, in the past that wasn't always applied. Uh, people would uh, just put the waste rock straight on top of the ground and then uh, when it came time to reclaim uh, those waste rock piles and close down the mine, they didn't have any soil material to be able to place over top of the waste rock and assist with the reclamation of that site. Uh, so now that's a straightforward process that's used to support reclamation um, later on in the mine site. Likewise, having a nursery on site that will um, grow the plants and grasses and other things, uh, you know, shrubs and etc., that are going to be replanted on the site to assist with um, uh, reclamation. Um, the other one now that I'll mention here is tailings. Uh, so what tailings are is once the ore, so this is the mineralized rock, the ore comes out of the pit and it goes to the process plant. So this is where it'll be crushed and it'll be ground down generally to a sort of a fine sand size that allows you to recover the valuable uh, minerals or elements out of the rock, uh, say your copper or your gold. And once you've recovered the copper and gold out of that finely ground rock, the rest of it then is referred to as tailings. Now, because it has been ground down to quite a fine sand size, it would not be stable if it was disposed of on the surface uh, like waste rock uh, because it's too fine. It would essentially wash away in you know, the next rainstorm. So tailings needs to be uh, disposed of in a way where it's supported often behind a tailings dam, uh, as we can see uh, right here. Um, and so that dam holds back these tailings, uh, preventing them uh, from you know, escaping and uh, running off of the uh, mine site. Uh, a leach pad, now not all mine sites are gonna have a leach pad. In some cases, the ore uh, that will be in the deposit is one where the metals in it can be leached out of the rocks uh, sort of directly without the need to go through a grinding phase. 
Uh, often the rock still needs to be crushed, you know, maybe down to pieces that big or something like that. Uh, but after the crushing phases, the ore is placed directly on these leach piles or leach pads and solutions are percolated down through that, uh, that pile of rock and the metals are leached out of it. And, it, you know, some mines, uh, and I should say that the most common type of ore uh, in which leaching works is oxide ore. Uh, so that's ore uh, in which the minerals have oxidized and um, often, uh, I'll just use one example, uh, gold is often trapped up in the sulfide mineral pyrite. But when that ore is exposed to the surface and the pyrite oxidizes and breaks down, the gold is liberated. And so uh, you can put the oxide ore on your leach pad, percolate your cyanide solution down through the leach pad, which is what will dissolve the gold and recover the gold that way. In a mine like that, you may not have any tailings at all then uh, because there's no grinding of the ore that, happening, uh, that happens. You'll just have leach pads and then those leach pads would be uh, reclaimed in place. In other mines, you might have both. Maybe the near surface ore is oxidized and you could recover it using a leach pad. And then as you get a little bit deeper down, you get below the level in which the ore has been oxidized to the sulfide ore. Uh, and then that ore would have to go to your process plant and uh, ultimately uh, produces um, tailings. Uh, and so, you know, the other things that you find in the site, of course, the process plant where we're recovering uh, the metals, um, you know, even in a leach pad, uh, we're going to have a solution with metal in it that you know needs to go to a, a process plant in order to, re to re ultimately recover say the gold out of that maintenance shops always a lot of maintenance and, and such that goes on um, with the equipment at a mine site uh, offices and labs almost all mine sites have a assay lab if it's a metal mine anyway they have their own on-site assay lab which they're constantly analyzing samples um, during the mining operation and I just want to mention uh, water collection ponds and, and that sort of thing. Uh, managing water on a mine site, of course, is really important. Uh, and one of the things you will see is that there will be a ditching put all the way around the mine site uh, that um, redire redirects any surface water that might flow onto the mine site. It redirects it away from the mine site so it doesn't flow over top of it. Uh, because any uh, water that does fall in this mine site is is going to need to be uh, collected uh, and treated if necessary, even if that's just letting dust and silt uh, settle out of it. Uh, and of course, um, you know, if there's any seepage out of the, the base of your tailings during operations or uh, out of waste rock or anything like that, that water will have to be collected and, and if necessary, treated uh, before it's released to uh, to the environment. So let's look at uh, an example now of a surface mine. Uh, this is the Highland Valley mine uh, located in central British Columbia. Uh, one of the largest, if not the largest mining operation in North America. So, so it's a good sized one. And in the photograph that we're looking at here, there's three different open pits that we can see. So the big one in the front is the valley pit. Uh, then in the mid background, we have the Lornex pit. And further back here, we have the high mount pit. So those actually represent uh, three different porphyry copper deposits that actually exist on this mine site. Um, uh, so just looking at the uh, valley pit, I mean, you can see the, the scale here, two kilometers across, so it's a good sized operation. And, you know, we're getting pretty deep down here. Uh, and so one of the things that they've, do, they've done is they've put an in-pit crusher and conveyor. Uh, that way, haul trucks that are sitting here at the bottom of the pit or operating at the bottom of the pit, don't have to, you know, travel all the way up this road and back and forth and make it all the way to the surface and go all the way over here to the process plant before they can dump their ore and then go all the way back underground. I mean, a truck might only get a couple or three trips in a day if it's doing that. Uh, so what is done here is they, they put a crusher uh, in the bottom of the pit. So as a whole truck uh, is carrying ore, comes, dumps the ore into a crusher, which starts that process of breaking down that ore. As the ore falls through the crusher, lands on the conveyor, and then the conveyor takes that material all the way out 
to the process plant where ultimately it'll be further crushed and ground in order to recover the copper out of it in the case of this particular mine. Um, waste rock, so you can see waste rock piles here and a number of them here in the background. Uh, some of these waste rock piles are, are now uh, reached their limit and they're starting to be reclaimed. So you can see vegetation starting to grow. Uh, I think in this case, um, there was some waste rock that had already um, uh, started to be reclaimed, but uh, this mine has, um, you know, it started in the 70s and its mine life is sort of continually being extended. Uh, so my guess is that um, as the mine life continued to extend, um, you know, they needed uh, more space to put waste rock. So they ended up putting it on top of some of their earlier waste rock piles. Um, it's always unfortunate if you do have to put it on top of reclaimed areas, but you know, sometimes that happens uh, as the mine continues to expand. Um, and this is the process plant over here. So this is where we ultimately do the final crushing and grinding of the ore and then the recovery of the copper mineral uh, out of that ore. Uh, here's where we have some offices and a drainage collection pond and etc. Uh, now what we're going to take a look at is the tailings disposal area, which is off here to the left. Uh, so we can't actually see that on this diagram. Uh, so here it is here. Uh, so the pits and everything we just saw were off to the right. Uh, here's the tailings disposal area. Um, so this is a big one. This is um, you know, certainly the biggest tailings disposal area that, that I've personally seen myself. Uh, about 10 kilometers long. Uh, there's the dam at the one end of it. And what happens uh, in the mill? So in your mill, uh, as you're grinding that rock down to the fine sand size, uh, that's a wet process. So it happens with water. And you know, once your copper minerals are recovered out of the ore, all the rest of that ground up material uh, is tailings. And it gets sent down to this tailings disposal area in a pipeline as a slurry. So it, it's as a, a wet um, material. Uh, it gets disposed of down here. And then uh, this water will be, you know, once the, the tailings actually settles out of it, will be pumped back over to the mine site uh, for reuse in the milling operation. So to you know, recirculate and make as much use of that water as possible. Uh, in some cases, if they end up with too much water or a high water balance here, um, they will you know, make sure that this can evaporate. Um, I've seen one example actually in Nevada where they used uh, this, this sort of equipment for snowmaking at ski hills. Uh, but essentially what they did is drew out water from the tailings area and it was a fine mist, not of snow or ice, but of water that went into the air and it just evaporated really quickly. So it was quite an effective way of, of reducing the, the amount of water uh, in the tailings area. Um, now these particular tailings, I mean, they're really quite benign. Um, they're, it looks sort of whitish. It's really kind of like a sand material. Um, you know, that's the nature of the rock that is mined at uh, Highland Valley. And, uh, you know, ultimately at the end of the mine life, um, this area will be reclaimed and, you know, those tailings will be reclaimed as a valley bottom. And, and ultimately, I believe uh, it would become grazing uh, lands uh, for cattle. Uh, just to look at another tailings um, uh, disposal area, this is one for the uh, Akia mine, uh, which is in Ghana and West Africa. Uh, and, you know, this isn't too long into the mine life. Uh, and what this one is, is what we'd more call like a ring dike, rather than there being a very specific dam at one end. Um, the photograph was taken standing on the tailings dam, and it sort of swings all the way around and then comes back on the other side uh, around here. So, um, Instead of it being a single dam, it would be referred to as a, as a ring dike. And, uh, you know, this is a little bit of a closer view of what the tailings look like. I mean, kind of looks like mud, right? It's dried up into to mud cracks. Um, and that's the idea. You do want it to be dry. Uh, some of the biggest problems that mines have had is with the failure of those tailings dams. And they often occur when the tailings are saturated and super wet. And... If you have a, a break in that dam and the tailings are all, all wet, they just flow right out and continue to erode the dam. And, and that's where we've had some of our real disasters with tailing da tailings dam failures. 
So often you want to keep your tailings quite dry like this, uh, so it's not in a slurry. If there was some challenge with the with the dam, uh, you're not going to end up with everything uh, flowing out. So uh, anyway, just another example of a tailings uh, disposal area. All right, so uh, stripping ratio. I've talked about stripping ratio a couple of times in some of our earlier videos. Uh, and so again, what is stripping ratio? Stripping ratio is the amount of waste that has to be removed relative to the ore. Uh, and so it's expressed, you know, like this as a ratio in this nature. It is, uh, so a stripping ratio here of 0.75 to one means that you're, you're gonna have to mine 0.75 of a ton of waste rock for every one ton of ore. So ideally what you want is the smallest uh, stripping ratio as possible, less than one to one is ideal. Uh, I think if you look at a lot of uh, metal mines that are out there, you know, um, one to one, two to one, sometimes even a bit higher is, is not uncommon, uh, but you wanna try to keep your stripping ratio as small as you can, um, otherwise, because otherwise really you're just moving a lot of waste rock uh, in order to be able to get at, uh, at the ore. And again, the reason is, is because, you know, there is a sort of a maximum slope that we can uh, make on the edges of our pit to maintain uh, safety, safety and stability of the mining operation. Now, just to, to give you an example of how, you know, uh, a stripping ratio has an impact on the ultimate economic limits of an open pit. Uh, if we look at this bottom example here, so what I've done is just said, okay, well, let's say we want to go just a little bit deeper down into the ore body and take just this little bit extra ore body here uh, from the image above. In order to do that and maintain the same uh, pit walls, we're now going to have to mine all of that waste rock there and all of that waste rock there. That actually changes the entire life of mine stripping ratio to one to one from 0.75 to one. Not just that piece, but the whole stripping ratio for the life of the mine. So you can see how very quickly as you get further and further down into the ground, uh, your stripping ratio is going to increase significantly. And you can pretty quickly get to a point where it's just no longer e economic to operate to, through surface methods. And if the ore body continues, of course, then you're going to do some evaluation about going underground and seeing whether it's possible for you to convert the open pit mine to an underground mine and continue to operate that way.